Good afternoon. It's my Friday. I'm on my way home. Uh, State of the Union address occurred recently. I didn't bother watching. Um, <laughs> heard lots of interesting things about it, um, but mostly that it was about Ukraine and the ongoing uh, war between Russia and Ukraine. Um, and there's just so much information swirling around about the conflict and what's going on. And people have been talking about just how hard it is to kind of sort out what's real, what's fake, what's propaganda, what's not. Um, and I mean, really, it does seem reasonable to just err on the side of everything is propaganda, right? Uh, like the, the ghost of Kiev, like I, it, it's a compelling story, right? You know, the ace pilot who's downed so many, you know, Russian MiGs and, um, you know, the desperate struggle against, you know, a superior force and, you know, uh, uh, you know, the lost cause and, you know, the noble last stand, like it, it's a compelling story. Um, and then, you know, you hear things about possible, you know, indiscriminate killing of civilians or, you know, the Ukrainians are, are actually beating back the Russians um, or, you know, just all this information flying around and, and who's to say, you know, what kernel of truth is the basis for any of that, if anything. Um, and it reminded me of, uh, for you sci-fi fans out there, um, an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine called, uh, I think it was In the Pale Moonlight. Um, and, you know, I don't want to lose all my non-sci-fi inclined friends here, but bear with me for a sec. Um, just to, to kind of set the stage and to make the comparison here. So uh, it, it's late in the series. Um, the, the United Federation of Planets is locked in just a, a cataclysmic uh, war with uh, another kind of galactic power called the Dominion, right? Uh, billions of people are dying, like billions of the B, right? Um, the uh, war looks hopeless. Um, you know, their, their friends and allies are abandoning them. Um, and, you know, like things look really, really grim. Um, and one of the Federation's old adversaries, local adversaries of the Romulan Star Empire, is sitting on the sidelines, um, biding their time, watching their enemies bleed each other to death uh, and kind of, you know, gleefully, you know, just eating their popcorn and watching the fireworks, right? Um, and, and this is frustrating to kind of the lead of the show, Captain Sisko, right? Because he realizes and recognizes that once the Dominion is done with the Federation, um, the Romulans are next. And the Romulans don't have the strength to withstand uh, the overwhelming might of, of the, the Dominion. Um, and so he, along with the assistance of a, a spy named Garrick, um, hatch this plan to bring the Romulans into the war. Um, and the entire episode is um, kind of framed with this monologue by Captain Sisko wrestling with the morality of what he set out to do and how he got led down this path of good intentions um, to try and save lives, right? And, and there's just, you know... Great acting by Avery Brooks. You know, people are dying, you know, in, in their millions. Um, and he's worried about his own kind of personal ethical code and and lying and covering for the crimes of other men um, to bring the Romulans into a war under false pretenses um, in order to achieve a greater good, right? And the Dominion are a totalitarian regime um, and they're, you know, foot soldiers are genetically engineered killing machines who, you know, really feel nothing and life under the Dominion would be, you know, just horrid, right? So, I mean, there's no question in the context of the show that, I mean, ultimately he's achieving a greater good by, by lying, cheating and stealing to get the Romulans into the war. Um, and what they actually end up doing is creating disinformation, right? They, they invite a Romulan senator to the station. They create this um, 
kind of phony recording of the Dominion conspiring to break the non-aggression pact with the Romulans, right? Um, they obtain a, a um, you know, very rare, difficult to get, um, you know, recording device that's only used for official recordings. Um, you know, they can concoct the story about how, you know, at least 10 good men died bringing this information along the line uh, and then, you know, show this Romulan senator the the recording of the Dominion secretly conspiring to launch this new offensive against the Romulans because the Romulans are passive and the Romulans are standing by and are unready for, you know, the Dominion to break the, the non-aggression treaty. It, it's very like, you know, Germany uh, breaking the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in World War II and in invading Russia right um, and so there, there's a lot of kind of you know parallels between World War II uh, that are drawn in the course of the show um, and ultimately um, the spy Garrick knows that Cisco being who he is Captain Cisco won't go as far as he needs to go to actually accomplish what he set out to do and Cisco lies to himself and believes that well the senator will buy the fake, everything will work out, the Romulans will get into the war, and, you know, it'll work. Um, and what he doesn't know is that Garrick knew all along the forgery would never believe. And the whole thing blows up in Cisco's face, and the Romulan center sets off to the Romulan Empire to expose Cisco and the Federation and their deception to try and bring the Romulans into the war. And the entire plan, as far as Cisco knows, backfired. Um, little did he know, Garrick, the spy, surreptitiously plants a bomb inside the senator's ship, right? And the ship explodes, killing the senator. Uh, and of course the Romulans find the ship and conveniently find the recording device, which damaged conceals the fact that the recording is a fake. So as Garrick says, with a dead senator in one hand and a seemingly genuine recording of the Dominion planning to break the treaty in the other, the Romulans are forced into the war, right? Um, and the, the forger who created the recording is murdered in the plot, and the captain also has to bribe people to conceal their plans. Uh, all sorts of just, you know, um, moral quandaries, which, again, the ultimate goal is to save millions, nay, billions of lives, right? Um, if you haven't watched the episode, it's on Netflix. Uh, it's a great episode, probably Star Trek at its best. Um, and, and it's because they, they grapple with these kind of shades of gray in um, a way that maybe classic Star Trek with, you know, William Shatner was a little more black and white, right and wrong, you know, Boy Scouts and salute the flag sort of stuff, right? Um, which isn't to say classic Trek didn't, you know, address moral issues too, but um, DS9 definitely, Dark, Deep Space Nine, uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine definitely um, took a much darker take than maybe Trek did um, while still kind of preserving the, the essence of what made um, maybe you know, next generation era Star Trek uh, great. Um, good show, good episode. Um, and so it, having said all that and thinking about where we're at now, right? Um, it, it begs the question, right? You know, if there's reports of Russian soldiers, you know, captured by the noble Ukrainians, uh, confessing, you know, we didn't know and we were forced into this and, you know, um, or, you know, the, the, the Russians are being beat back and there's hope and the Ukrainians should fight on and take up arms. Um, or, you know, that the war is going very badly for Russia, or that, you know, there's horrible genocides happening, and, you know, and standing on the sidelines means the death of thousands or tens of thousands, right? Um, which isn't to say any of that's false, right? Just like, you know, in the episode, millions of people were dying in this cataclysmic war. Um, but it, it's easy to use that to conceal the fact that we might be being lied to, right? And and I, I think people recognize that. And already, you know, media is just horridly lacking in credibility. Um, and, and the same people who were wrong about so many things for so many years um, now telling us that we should intervene somehow in Ukraine, um, we have to be skeptical, right? We, we have to be. 
Um, and, you know, d despite what's going on, we, we should really evaluate whether or not we need to become involved. Um, and there are, you know, a lot of entitled people on places like Twitter, you know, uh, making World War II comparisons when, you know, World War II was a conventional war and horrific to be sure, um, but not nuclear, right? Uh, and there's a reason mutually assured destruction and the Cold War um, mercifully precluded any direct conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States. Um, and so imposing something like a no-fly zone over Ukraine, um, we never did anything like that in, in the Cold War, right? We never went directly toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Russians. I mean, so insofar as I um, understand it, I mean, like in, in a hot shooting war context, I mean, there was proxy wars, right? And then that's kind of what's happening now because the West, you know, all of NATO... Um, I mean, even Switzerland's off the bench on this one are funneling weapons and, you know, um, coordinating sanctions against Russia. Um, but yeah, imposing a no-fly zone, we are now sending, you know, NATO or U.S. pilots over Ukrainian airspace to shoot down Russian fighters and Russian bombers. Um, is that what, what's being proposed? Um, and of course, you know, there's a lot of saber rattling coming from the Russians about, you know, their, uh, strategic nuclear forces being on high alert. Uh, and you know, yeah, saber rattling for sure. Um, but is, is it unjustified? You know, I, I think it's not unreasonable to say that, you know, we need to be concerned about getting into a shooting war with a nuclear power. Um, and people don't realize, too, um, the Russians and the Chinese, at least so far as my understanding takes me, um, have contemplated nuclear war that perhaps to a, an extent that the West or the U.S. or at least the general public in the U.S. have not. Um, for example, traveling overseas uh, and going to China and going to like a new mall in a big city. Um, so this isn't like a Cold War era relic, right? This is this is new construction. And the, the parking garages were subterranean and they had these massive blast doors, right? To close off in the event that these subterranean parking structures in the middle of big cities needed to be used as fallout shelters. And the Chinese have actually been significantly building up their stockpile of nuclear weapons while we continue to, you know, decommission nukes. And, you know, like our, our ballistic missile submarines, from what I understand, don't go out fully loaded. Um, you know, you've got these, these MIRVs, these multiple in, independently targeted reentry vehicles on the top of ballistic missiles. And you can pack like, I don't know, seven or so warheads into a single ICBM. And, you know, the, the ballistic missile subs go out with like three or four per missile, uh, which, I mean, it's still, I mean, it, it just a massive amount of firepower, but um, it, it, it speaks to maybe the complacency we have about nuclear conflict. And, and uh, we are so unwilling to use them. And, and I mean, I, I get why, but we're so unwilling to use nuclear weapons that um, we, we almost ignore possibility of some kind of limited nuclear nuclear exchange whereas the the Russians and the Chinese I think have made contingency plans to do precisely that I mean in the event of a war or from you know the, the projections and and the discussions I've, I've looked at and again I'm, I'm a layman here but um, you know it, the tactical nukes have always been part of the battle plan for the Russians. Um, and, you know, it, it, should they find themselves on the back foot and NATO gets involved, like any aggression towards the Russians could lead to some kind of limited nuclear exchange to slow down, you know, the advance of ground forces to, you know, bring Western nations to the negotiating table. Um, and if they feel like we don't have the will to use them, then certainly as, as a, um, you know, leverage tool against us, right? That, 
you know, would if they launched a single missile, right, toward a military target somewhere in continental Europe, are we going to order, we as, as in NATO, order a full, you know, nuclear strike against them, right? Are we going to wipe out Russia? Are we going to order a proportional response? Are we going to select a military target somewhere inside of Russia and launch a single missile? If we do that, what is going to be the response from the Russians? They launch two, we launch two, or, I mean, you, you see how this could rapidly escalate out of control. Um, and, and I mean, it's just, it, it shouldn't go there. And I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, Russian aggression against the Ukrainian people needs to just be given a pass. It shouldn't. Um, and I think, you know, to the credit of NATO and the Biden administration, they're pulling the levers available to them. Uh, and I think the NATO buildup in Europe is appropriate, right? I mean, a, a sovereign nation has been invaded. <laughs> that is unacceptable. And, and it should never happen. Um, and I, I, I don't want to be careful here. I, I'm not rooting for Russia. Um, and I don't think anybody worth listening to is rooting for Russia here. Um, nevertheless, I think it is easy to understand what their strategic interests are and why this is happening. And this has been predicted. Um, and had we been a little more proactive in one respect or another, this could have been prevented. And it's easy to play Sunday quarterback. Um, but, you know, if NATO was going to incorporate Ukraine, then we should have just kind of got off the pot and done it, right? Um, before the war started. And if, if the West, if NATO had given some sort of guarantee to Ukraine by bringing them into the fold before the war started, um, then I think Russia would have thought twice about invading, right? Um, but since we didn't do it and we kind of had tried to have it both ways, right? We were slowly sort of integrating Ukraine and, you know, um, applying political pressure um, to get, you know, pro-Western governments installed um, and, you know, still sending weapons and putting things like THAAD, if you don't know what that is, look it up, um, in Ukraine without going the full meal deal, we were asking for trouble, right? We should have either incorporated them into NATO or made it clear to the Russians that they would not become a part of NATO and, and the Russians did not need to consider the incorporation of, of Ukraine a security concern, right? Um, but, I mean, that, that's really a moot point of this right now, right? I mean, the, the war has started and all we're really left with is, you know, what do we do now? Uh, and what is the level of our intervention? You know, and, and I've heard it said, and I think it's a, a legitimate point, that like sanctions at this level are, are essentially a declaration of war. Uh, I mean, sure, we haven't declared war. I and mean, gosh, when was the last time we actually declared war on somebody? We've been involved in wars without declaration of wars, uh, despite what the Constitution says. Um, but hey, when you put a stranglehold economically on a country like we're doing now, um, you leave them with very few alternatives. Now, hopefully that'll bring the Russians to the negotiating table. I don't know, we'll see. Um, but this could all backfire spectacularly and we could all pay the price. Um, I don't know, just it, be wary of what you hear. Certainly don't take anything I say at face value. I mean, I, I, I go out of my way to tell people to read more, right? Be skeptical, do, you know, and, and don't take things at face value, especially from uh, the powers that be. As somebody, you know, uh, referenced that, the, I think it was like some kind of meme or something like, you know, in the, in the 60s, you know, the CIA did awful things. And in the 70s, the CIA did awful things. And in the 80s, the CIA did awful things. And in the 90s, the CIA did awful things. And so on and so on. But this year, I'm sure they're, you know, acting with our best interests in heart, right? Um, I, I'm just saying, folks, you know, uh, 
and, and I, I'm a little disappointed in all the, you know, staunch anti-war uh, protesters from yesteryear who seem to have turned into some kind of war hawks um, when, again, you know, this is a nuclear power. And had those folks uh, been in the driver's seat um, making those kinds of noises during something like the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, we might have ended up, you know, bombed back to the Stone Age and not even having this conversation anymore. Um, I don't know. Scary stuff. But uh, here's hoping everything turns out for the best. It's been fun. Catch you on the next one.